Back in 1984, the words sustainable production were hardly even thought of in Australian agriculture, let alone the practice of them. But in that year, 15 farmers here in Western Victoria, sheep and cattle people, accepted the challenge of the Ian Potter Foundation to have a go at sustainable production. And the series you're about to see is their story, their experiences and what they've learnt. Now, initially, there were three intensive years of farm planning and redevelopment. Years when the farmers experimented with a wide range of ideas, which in the end meant farming with nature rather than fighting it. In doing this, they put their livelihoods on the line. They also invested heavily in their money and time. And test it to see and in this, this case, it's uh, 5,300 parts per million salt. The series doesn't pretend to have all the answers. There's not a long list of rules which everyone should follow, far from it. Rather, there's a collection of principles which have been found to work for these people around here after they've done a lot of experiments. I think they're good ideas because they've been developed by farmers themselves Farmers who are absolutely determined to beat the degradation of their land while making more dollars at the same time. What's more, they've done in three short, tough years what thousands of their associates right around Australia must do in the very near future, like now. Well, tonight has a theme which is called a reflection on the Potter Demonstration Farm Project. And what better place to do it in than this marvellous building? A building which has dedicated itself to learning. And I'm sure that that's what all of you would be wanting to tell me tonight about the last five years, apart from many other things, it really has been a learning experience. While I'm suspicious of politicians who say to uh, small gatherings like this, you have a lot to be proud of, I really believe that you have a lot to be proud of. Because it's quite obvious, as we come to the end of the 80s, that what you have done in the last five years is really absolutely at the top of the agendas with governments around the world and with thousands of communities around the world and that is the deterioration of the environment. The idea was that uh, they would have the opportunity of looking at the whole proposition of establishing on their farms a sustainable operation. This would mean replanting the whole farm in harmony with the ecology of the land. It would attempt, first of all, to improve the operation and at the same time re redress the degradation because the 
the whole business of production and conservation are just simply two sides of the one coin. If you handle your land in harmony with the ecology of the soil, you will get better results and it will be sustainable. So we then said to them, well, it's your show. You tell us what's the criteria on which you would pick the farms and what criteria would you lay down for selecting the farmers on those farms? They appointed an advisory committee locally that uh, would work with them and they then um, sent an independent group out to select from the 60 applicants the ones who'd be the demonstration farmers. By this time, they'd owned it. It was their show. We said simply, we stand behind. You'll have two people to, to advise you, a project manager, an assistant. They will be able to talk with you about your plans. They will put up alternative possibilities. They'll get you to think the thing through. But you must make up your own minds as to what you want to do. Um, it's your decision. It's your farm. We're not running it. It's your show. The resources that are available in this country to tackle the massive problem of land degradation aren't going to come from governments alone. In fact, a tiny proportion can only come from governments. If Australia is ever going to come up with, with farming systems that don't degrade the environment they're on, it's going to have to come through a redistribution of resources at the farm level. And that means that the farmer has to be the person doing the planning and asking everyone else to respond to those local needs. There's no good just addressing the land degradation issues that it was very important to design a, a farming system that was not just uh, uh, kind to of the environment but was able to sustain a family as well. Across Australia and on our farms the thing that strikes my mind is the enormous energy of our pioneers. The great improvements that they've made, the radical changes, the great lift in production and very briefly for example just on our farm in, in more recent times, from 1940 until 1980. 1940, 12 bales of wool. 1980, 120. A tenfold increase. So, radical changes. And hats off, I think, to our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. I think they've done a fantastic job. But I think our job is to look upon that and think at what cost. And, and recognise that some damage has been done to our farms. I think this generation needs to re-evaluate and think, can we sustain this production into the future and indeed improve it? I always felt it was a great thing to belong to a team of people who were involved in all aspects of the development of sustainable agriculture. It was a team operation, just as it became a team operation with the farmers. The Potter people had said to the farmers, well, here's a possibility. We're prepared to back you if you can make a demonstration that will help the rest of Australia see what could be done if you work in harmony with the ecology of the land. And the last thing we want to do is, is say we're fixing up what our parents mucked up because we're not doing that at all. The time was right to go, I felt, and I had a go. We've been taught to take a fresh look at our farm and we think, it's not too well, and unless it sustains production in the future, we won't be able to make money off it. Therefore, we must make the farmland plan pay. We must. A lot of these ideas were around the country, but, and, and it, there'd been an enormous amount of land degradation work already done, but what Potter did was bring it all together and put it in a plan and, and, and you know, make it obvious to us as well as others. Potter is not saying it's all got to be done in three years like ours was. Mm. But it's saying that we have to have a plan which will be carried out in whenever it can be done. You're not willing to try something, you're going to sit there, you're not going to progress, you're not going to get anywhere. It's not just tree planting, uh, but you go out and do all the other things involved in whole farm planting and use that tree as the symbol, but not to the exclusion of all other operations on the farms. We can improve our farm, feel much more comfortable at home, uh, help the environment and make more money. Well, you said to someone you could revegetate the whole of Australia's farming land in 20 years. Um, that would be something pretty amazing. It would well within the bounds of possibility. Farming was a way of life, but it's certainly changed now. Now it's a business, and unless we treat it as, as a business, uh, we've got no chance of keeping up. Of the 15 demonstration farms in the western districts of Victoria, the series will concentrate on the work of five of the farmers. Bill Spears runs Satima with his brother Jack, 
in the steep exposed valleys of Wando Vale. They've always been involved with the Soil Conservation Authority and the Potter project was a natural step for them. Bruce Milne owns Helm View with his brothers Andrew and John. Of all the Potter farmers, he's become the most passionate communicator, being deeply committed to the future health of Australia's land. Helm View was an ideal choice for the project, as it was severely degraded, with massive salt, erosion and tree decline problems. David McDonald is a young farmer who bought his property with his father in the windswept plains of Glen Thompson. They say around here that the wind had blow a dog off a chain. The property had a few large paddocks, four trees, and some of the best gullies you've ever seen. By replanning the units, and through tree establishment and pasture programs, he's turned the place into a productive operation. And David is a dedicated tree grower. Ross Kitchen is a quiet bloke who lets his actions speak for him. When he bought his block next door to Bill Spears, the pastures were run down, the fences in disrepair, and there was obvious salinity, erosion and tree decline. Through an enormous amount of hard work, he's turned the place around, and now it's one of the best demonstration farms in the project. Peter Walden has been described as a battler, who's included shearing, woodcutting and fencing amongst his occupations to supplement farm earnings. He can remember putting up the original fencing with his dad and grubbing out the last of the stumps on Wallandra. He's open-minded and he's a thinker too, the epitome of a practical and hard-working farmer. He decided that rather than buy a new block, he'd put his time and resources into making Wallandra more productive. And his achievements over the last five years are quite remarkable. Whilst these are grazing operations in Western Victoria, the series will also examine the work of other people, especially cropping people, to see how the experiences here on the demonstration farms compare with other parts of Australia, where conditions can be so very different, but the challenges so familiar. It's a bit of an irony, I guess, in that 60, for they've spent 60 years cursing the bloody trees, and now all they want to do is get out there and put as many in the ground as they can. There are eight videos in the series. The first two describe Australia's farmlands, a kind of ecological journey through its history and present condition. From there, we take the ecology principles and apply them to the farm operation to match management with the land. It will examine fence lines, vegetation, shelter, access around the farm, water distribution and control, crop and pasture strategies. Our folk stories and history speak of Australia as being an old, tough and rugged place. It was, and it still is. The farming methods we inherited from Europe had evolved over centuries. A long process of clearing and of small farm management. And that was on deep, rich soils, far richer and deeper than most Australian land, and with the advantage of light and frequent rains. On the world map, Australian farmlands can be likened not with European farms, but with the rugged dry areas from the same hemisphere that we share with South America and Africa. Land which is far older and far less fertile than many people realised. Tough land to manage. The early farmers didn't understand the soil. They were there to work it and somehow eke out a living. What they didn't realise was that the soil, like the sea, is a living system. If for some reason all the vegetation was removed from the ocean floor, nearly all underwater life would perish. As unthinkable as this may seem, it has happened on the surface. By removing most of the trees, we radically altered the ecosystem, and in doing so, 
removed the system that protected our topsoil. The grasses, the water, the air, the birds, the insects, the organisms in the ground itself, the sunshine, they all interact to make a whole system. It's a living system which nature has created to grow things and to sustain that growth, be it flora, fauna or farm produce. Now, if that system has changed dramatically, so too is the capacity to sustain itself. And to understand all that, all we have to do, as usual, is to go beneath the surface. The original land around here would have been something like this. Red gums, black wattles, manna gums, yellow box, banksias, native grasses, with birds, wildlife and insects. And in the soil, roots like the red gums stretching for an extraordinary length. Their pumping action draws the water back through the root system and up to the surface, and from there to be evaporated back into the atmosphere. Add to this the web of root systems from the plants and grasses, all reaching deep, each tapping nutrients and water. And then there's an amazing collection of life, bugs, worms and spiders. And then finally, the microorganisms, which work full time, mixing and enriching the soil. This incredible combination of plants, microorganisms and insects working the soil is a continual process. And a healthy crumb structure is attained by the breaking down, the digestion and the sticking together of all this matter. With good structure, the water is able to run through the soil making the nutrients more accessible to the plant's roots. And then much of the rain has transpired back into the atmosphere, keeping the water table at a balanced level. While each region of Australia is different, the principles of soil are the same worldwide, and soil structure is a critical factor for growth. What this all means, of course, is that it supports what is growing. It's the principles of ecology in application, where we have a complete and sustaining natural support system. Now, the big question is, how do we have a natural support system on farmland when we want to maintain production, or even better, increase it? <laughs> 